Well, good morning this morning. It's so uh, good uh, to have you with us today, whether you're watching online, inside, outside, online. We are grateful to have you. Um, by the way, parents, if uh, it's, uh, just keep in mind that there is a kid service and you can set them up, them up on that as well so that you can engage and pay attention. Maybe get your kids going on the online service for them. Don't forget. Well, I know we just prayed, but I just want to pray for a moment um, over this message today and over you that are watching it. Um, Holy Spirit, we just invite you into this place, wherever we are at today, just come. We look to you, Lord, and you alone to lead us. May your spirit put an end to the chaos and the confusion in each of us. Break off all distractions, Holy Spirit, this morning. Give us incredible focus. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, Lord. Teach your people today through me. I pray that they will see Jesus and hear Jesus, and you'll just remove me even out of the picture, God. Let it speak directly to their spirit today. In your name, amen. Well, it's 2021, as if you didn't know. Um, and what a week that it has been. Just continue to pray for our nation as God's people. I ask that you would do that. Our new spring series, you might have noticed we had a new branding come up. Uh, do good, fear nothing. And when you kind of know that phrase, do good, because we use it a lot. And it makes you immediately think about our social engagement. And we give you those ways in which you can serve and give. But I want to focus you more on, and I want you to remember that an act of doing Good is to actually spend time in God's presence. In fact, it should be your first and foremost act. So, uh, and then the fear nothing part, many times I think when I've, just in relation to the message I'm talking about today, but many times I think we're held back by our fears and our fear of God. And it's like this, you will either fear God or trust God, but you cannot do both at the same time. So you pick what you're going to do, but you just can't do both. Uh, you must let go of your fears and open up your heart to God if you want to be free. And the Bible speaks about fearing God, you might say, and I would say, yes, he does. But it actually, that language that is speaking of and fearing God has to do with an awe and a respect and a reverence for God. And we, when we even say the word fear or fearing God, it just elicits emotions of angst in us. And, uh, and, but fear is, is good only when it comes to turning us from sin and turning us to God, then that's a good fear. But once we turn to Christ, then there is no fear in love. There is no fear. And perfect love, as we know the scripture tells us, cast out all fear. So we as God's children are not to fear. We have a loving God. God longs to be with you. Think about that. He desires to make each of us. He desires to make you whole and complete and that you would be free from anything that binds you. I just don't think we understand how that we're supposed to participate with the Spirit, and we're going to go there a little bit today. But Paul explained and said, these, uh, said this in Philippians 2, 5. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Hmm. And then in 1 Corinthians 2, 16, it, says, it talks about the mind of Christ. It is our attitude that needs to be changed and made like Christ attitude. Now, attitude, what's an attitude? Well, some people, you may say, you know, well, well, I know somebody has attitude, right? But attitude is your viewpoint. It's your ideas. Um, it's your way of thinking. It's your thoughts. Attitude is there. So when we say this, we are, we are wanting to have the thoughts of Christ, that attitude of Christ. We want to think like he thinks, not a human attitude. A very human attitude. And Philippians 1, 6 says this. And I am certain that God, who began the good work within you, will continue his work until it is finally finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. The Spirit began a good work in you, like within you, at your salvation. 
if you gave your heart to the Lord. And this is an inside or inner work of the Spirit that's changing your thinking, your attitude. And this ongoing work of the Spirit is one of God that will go and will keep going on. God does the work, not you. Your part is only being willing, being open, and being yielded. So if you want the Holy Spirit to do something amazing in your life, you've got to be open to it. Paul says in the Colossians chapter 3, verse 3 through 4, and I, I think, I don't know, you know, people talk about having a life first, like this is their verse, and for some strange reason, I, this is the only verse that I've ever really felt incredibly drawn to that might would be my life verse. And it, it goes like this. For you died to this life, and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all his glory. So your old life, get this, what this verse is saying is your old life, the old you, is the false you. It's not the real you. With all its formulas for happiness, this old you died on the cross with Christ. Your real life, the real one, the true one, the, is hidden with Christ in God. Nowhere does it say you, have, you, you cannot have your real life now. It just says that it's hidden. We are to seek God to find the treasures that he has hidden for us. It's only hidden to be found. Our true identities are hidden with Christ in God. And I firmly believe that. Who you really are, your real life. Who desires to reveal them to those who love him? Do you love him? The spirit will not trespass any part of your life. He waits. The spirit will not invade your will. He waits. But he waits to be welcomed by you, and he waits for you to want him. I think sometimes we have to have enough trouble, chaos, anxiety, and all those things to see something's not working in our lives. But as we permit the Holy Spirit more and more access, God will remove the many things that are blocking us from our real life that is hidden with Christ in God, our true identity. That just should stir up a lot of curiosity within all of us to say, wait a minute, I really don't even know who I am. The one who made you will have to show you. God gave me this saying a long time ago, and I think I've come to understand it more and more with every year that passes, but God removes many things. So out of no things, he can do a new thing. So God's gonna remove many things from your life so that when there are no things left, he will do a new thing. There are many things that block us from happiness, such as our past wounds and painful experiences. We need freedom from these. We need freed from things like negative thinking and negative talking and negative behavior, freed from anxiety, stress, anger, and worry. The trouble actually begins in childhood early childhood even, when you are unable to process painful experiences because you do not know how to deal with them. You actually repress them within. They have not left you. They remain held within your unconscious. And if you don't find this fascinating, you should. I have an opening story for you. I call it the story of the lost key. Maybe a uh, have you ever heard the story of the teacher who lost the key? There was a teacher that lost the key to his house. And so he was outside looking for it. He got down on his hands and on his knees and he's searching through the weeds outside. And along came a number of his students and they asked him, hey, what's wrong? And he answered, I've lost the key to my house. And the teachers, to, to his delight, the students offered to help him. So they all got down on their hands and their knees and they started searching through the weeds outside. And after some time had passed, the sun beating down on them, one of the students asked, teacher, do you have any idea where you might have lost your keys? And the teacher replied, of course, I lost them in the house. 
To which all of the students cried out, then why are we looking out here? And he answered, isn't it obvious there is more light out here? So we have all lost the key to our house. This is actually a parable. The key represents the key to our happiness. Happiness is found in one thing and one thing only, but we don't know how to get there. Our original parents, Adam and Eve, were with God in the garden and they lived in complete happiness before their fall. But now we all humans ever since are without the key to happiness. We lack it. And we search everywhere out there trying to find it. Every one of us do. This is the human condition. Life without the true source of happiness. So my question today, and I like to start with a question. So is this for you to think about? Where are you searching for happiness? Where are you searching for happiness? Because everyone is. In your marriage? In your spouse? Are you looking for a spouse? A birth of a child or in your children? In your career, your education, accomplishments, an accumulation of things. Biblically, you should know that all substitutes for the divine presence were called false gods and demons. So we are looking for happiness in the wrong places, outside. None of these things within themselves perhaps are bad or evil, but we make them that way because none of these things can satisfy us because they never were meant you know, I've been using science and talking science uh, in here, and I want to bring a little science in at this point. Einstein believed that all sciences led toward the discovery of God. Quantum physics is looking into the unknown to see what is beyond the known. This is a science in search of what is the ultimate reality. St. Augustine said, all truth is God's truth. According to St. Augustine, original sin, and that started with our original parents, right? Adam and Eve. Their sin had three consequences. And these are important for us to understand today. The three sins or three consequences are ignorance, lust, and we're unmotivated. So ignorance just means that we don't know where to find the happiness. We don't know where it can be found. And lust is that we look for it in all the wrong places, Chasing after all kinds of things, thinking it'll fill us. And then open and motivated is we lack the desire to actually pursue God, the source of happiness. One of psychology's most important discoveries is the unconscious. And the unconscious is the part of the mind which is inaccessible to the conscious mind, but it affects behavior and emotions. It's a neurological process for your body actually to store up all those experiences all the way through your life from the time actually you were even in the womb. Your past is recorded in your body. So much of your past history is held outside of your conscious awareness that you don't know what you don't know. So it's no wonder Studies reveal that over 95% of us are plagued by psychological problems, such as codependency and dysfunctional families. Anxiety disorders, including panic disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, and phobias. Depression, bipolar disorder, and other mood orders. Eating disorders, personality disorders, post-traumatic stress disorders. And I think this is all in the church. It's not just in the world. For such reason, we have been given the Holy Spirit who just so happens to be a counselor. The Holy Spirit is our psychotherapist, if you will. Christians, we are not well. We are not living fully into who we were created to be, our true identity. A therapist can actually help us to discover the unconscious memories which are blocking us from living a healthier life. I do believe this is also the work of the Holy Spirit and no one can do it as completely as he can. But a licensed psychotherapist to assist us can be good at times and freeing you from the unconscious obstructions, things you just don't know that are there to help you even process past experiences then teach you how to release them. 
Science actually reveals that all humans have three essential biological needs. You have three essential biological needs, science tells us. And here they are. Security, power, and affection. Everyone needs this. Every human being has to have this. Security is safety. You need that safety to be safe. An infant's born, they have to be protected. They have to be cared for. Safety, power, which is control, and affection, esteem, and love. We all need this. When a child is deprived to some degree of any of these, she develops a desperate drive to find them. These three primary needs are what we will use or what we use to search for happiness. That's what humanity is using to search for happiness. You're driven by either all of these or some of these or one of these. Which one is it? What is it that happened to you in childhood? We all have developed homemade programs, formulas for our happiness. And I want you to hear me, they will never satisfy. I firmly believe only in God's presence is their satisfying sense of happiness. It's never going to be the job you get. It's never going to be the place you arrive at. And we just run around thinking, if I can just get this, or I can just get that, or I can just have this position, this place, or this thing. What was lost in the garden, you can only fully return to through spiritual practices. I'm going to help you today. It is the only way. Though we all keep trying to find happiness outside in the world, in people, places, and things, we have all sorts of addictions and bad habits to cope with our lack of happiness. His presence indwells within you, and it's important to understand that. It is not outside of you. It is within you. If you have received Christ, then Christ's presence is indwelling within you. That's why we say, Emmanuel, God with us. In his presence, we are fully loved. We can know we are fully loved. We are fully accepted. All those biological needs are found in his presence. And there we can be transformed through Christ by his spirit. Our true identity is found in his presence. You will never find it at college or anywhere else. Our personality, our gifts, and our callings, who we were created to be, can never fully flourish without the source. Prayer, the purpose of prayer is not to change God's mind or to change God, but it is to change you. We treat God as if he is our servant, telling God what to do and how to do it in prayer. And we think that is prayer. Psalms 46.10, I'm going to read the NIV, the NLT, and the, M, and the message version of that. Psalms 46.10 says this. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Boy, we have nothing to worry about. We don't have to get God exalted. He says he will be. NLT, be silent and know that I am God. I will be honored by every nation. I will be honored throughout the world. It's not our responsibility. Message virgin, step out of the traffic. Take a long loving look at me, your high God, above politics, above everything. I don't know, I feel I just want to say wow or amen or yes or something there. Rafa is the Hebrew word for what be silent or be still. Rafa. And it means this. Sink down, relax, withdraw, let go, be quiet. Oh, if we Christians could learn this. Be still, be silent. Rafa, sink down, relax, withdraw, let go, be quiet. Sounds like trust God to me. In the Old Testament, the Spirit actually led God's people. A cloud by day and a fire by night to their promised land. To enter into his Rest. Mm. And God desires that you, me, that all of us learn how to enter into his rest. If we learn to quiet our internal dialogue, we will find rest. But we must learn. 
The Spirit needs access to our overactive mind in order to set us free and to make us whole. We have not been taught how to enter into rest in most churches. It's true we have learned how to enter into his presence with praise and worship. Thank God for that. We have learned how to make our requests and petitions known. But now we need to learn how to be quiet. <laughs> we must learn to rafa, be still, sink down, relax, withdraw, and to let go. As Psalms 46.10 says, be silent. Quiet in our busy minds, stopping the constant commentary going on in our heads about everything, constant thoughts, which are attached to emotions, which come with those thoughts, which become so strong we can't even think clearly. Meditation. I've already mentioned in the past messages how some Christians fear the word meditation, believing that it's not biblical. You can find things online about this. My goodness, how ridiculous it is to think that we can talk in prayer but not be quiet in prayer. True prayer is being present to God, period. We need quietness, especially if we are from a charismatic or Pentecostal background. We've never been taught it. So have you ever felt, and, and this has happened to me in my prayer time, I feel like God was just saying, stop talking. <laughs> stop talking, Darla. Be quiet. Just rest. There's no need for words. There is wordless prayer. Just be with me. If we are ever to mature in our relationship with God, we will have to learn how to quiet our overactive thought life. It just never stops, it seems. It's a disciplining of your mind that takes much practice. Stopping the constant chatter. We need to learn how to stop thinking about ourselves and what we think and how we feel and all the distractions that are constantly going on in there. Meditation is a slow process whereby we learn to be quiet and rest. It is the act of not doing but simply being present to God. And boy, how we Christians struggle. This is so completely foreign even to our Western culture to just be present. Through meditation, we are letting go of our false self, the one we created, the homemade self, the, homemade self, the self-centered self, with all its programs for its happiness. The false self is identified also with outside groups like others who agree with our point of view, our attitude, our way of thinking, our race, our religion, our politics, all our biases. Our false self is a part of our programs of happiness, a path of self-centeredness, and it leaves us very, very unfulfilled. Every time we get that thing that we think we want that's going to make us happy, Mm -mm. It never does. Learning the simple practice of how to sit quietly in God's presence is a must if we are going to live a healthy life. The good news is that research on meditation show it has a profound impact on lowering anxiety and reducing stress. Mm. This means it cuts at the roots of 67% of all diseases and illnesses which Western medicine hasn't been able to do. And that statistic is from the Amer American Medical Association. 67% of all diseases and illnesses have to do with your stress, anxiety, anger, emotions going on in you. There's a simple way to get you started. I want to take some time in this message to actually be terribly practical to give you what you need. There's something called centering prayer, and I've talked about it in the past, but I'm going to walk you through it again because I'm certain most of you thought still you didn't need it. But as things get crazier and crazier, you might want to reflect back or remember this or go back to this message. 
Centering prayer is a simple practice that helps bring you into the presence of God and helps you stay there for a period of time. You will find other ones as well, but this can get you started. Number one, relax. You got to slowly breathe, typically a calming effect when we breathe slowly on our whole mind and body system. Find a comfortable position. Sit on the floor in a chair or lie down and close your eyes because shutting your eyes a lot of times can shut down a lot of the distractions going on around you. Sacred word. A word is recommended in centering prayer. You can choose a word that is sacred meaning to you. Uh, the word is not your focus, but it helps you initially focus your scattered mind, your scattered thoughts, and bring your attention in. You might choose the word like Jesus or peace or love. This word is only to help you with the many distracting thoughts that will come, and they will come. Whenever distracting thoughts come, in a very non-judgmental and kind way, gently return to your word. Using your centering word to redirect your mind back from each and every distraction as you catch yourself. This takes much practice. Be very patient and kind to yourself. Then letting go. This is a key to meditation, the letting go part we must get. As soon as you attempt to quiet your mind, many thoughts are going to bombard you. They're going to come rushing in as if they've been right outside the door waiting for the moment in which you were quiet and then they just whoosh, in on you. You'll suddenly remember things that you need to do, prayers that you need to pray. You will feel an urge to stop and make a to-do list or a prayer list. Let it go. Letting go of all things, all thoughts, stopping the constant chatter in your head, yielding to the Spirit of God in silence. The meditation, this meditation is a quiet reception of the Holy Spirit. When we quiet our minds in His presence, when you first begin an attempt, Again, I want to stress this. When you first attempt this, many, 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 many distracting thoughts are going to flood in as soon as you silence yourself. And here's a good example that kind of gives you the picture of this. Your thoughts are like boats on a river that, are com that come by on your conscious. Do not stare at them. Let them go on by. Do not get on board of them and go inside and look around. You will at first, but as soon as you realize it, let them go on by. Go back to your sacred word. Simply let them go by each time you need to refocus by going back to your word. Thoughts usually come with emotions attached to them. Do you know that? Distracting emotions. Emotions can be very distracting. Negative feelings, anxiousness, stress, anger. Ignore them. Let them go too. It is time and in time, as you continue to practice meditation, blockages may emerge into your consciousness. These are memories held in the unconscious I was talking about, childhood memories, things that are impressed and held within your body and your unconscious. And as they emerge and as they come, just let them go too. Like boats on the river, let them go on by. They are the things that are blocking you and the Holy Spirit's job is to clear them. So as memories emerge from the unconscious, learn to let them go or they'll yank you out of meditation. The Holy Spirit is working to remove things from your life. And the interesting thing is the Holy Spirit will start at the top shelf, the most recent things that are blocking you. Maybe there's unforgiveness. Maybe there's something that happened that week. Just begin to let things go. I've actually had, an, I've had God bring things up in meditation and later I was like, God, why did that come to mind? Why did I have that flashback? Why did I have that memory? And the Lord just said to me, so you give it to me, just give it to me. Let me have it. That all I was supposed to do is just let it go. Over time in meditation, the boats will become more and more spread out. There were longer periods of time in which you will have mental rest in his presence in wordless prayer. Processing memories. There are some memories that you may need to process through with someone else. And there's when a therapist or someone who can give you some spiritual guidance so that you can let it go. Still, you have to let it go. Practice meditation daily, daily, daily. Be faithful to it if you want it to have a work in you. 
Start with just five minutes, something that you can get successful at, and then go to 10 minutes and slowly work your way up to the ideal 20 minutes, as so many say. But if you can do longer than that eventually, that would be wonderful. You must have your very own daily spiritual practice to restore the health of your mind and body system. Hear me, it is as critical to your health, mentally and physically. It breaks addictions, which are just coping mechanisms for all the pain and the stress and all that you have gone through in your life. If you want to live whole, have happiness, and be in your true identity, I am giving you the path today. Another meditation that's transformational, and there's many out there, is just a prayer sentence. I thought some of the lines today of Angie's song would have been a great prayer sentence or to just repeat in your life, but choosing a prayer sentence rather than a single word. You might choose a scripture or a psalm like, God is my refuge and my strength, or my peace I give to you, Jesus' words, or the peace, or be still, right, and know that I am God. That's a good one. Gradually, as you repeat in your mind throughout the day these same words over and over again, it will sink into your subconscious, amazingly enough. The purpose is to erase the old program of the subconscious, the negative program, the emotionally charged program, and deliberately not think your normal thoughts. It actually works in your brain. Meditation ultimately will train your brain to remain calm and not to overreact. Then perhaps not so surprisingly, compassion develops for others, empathy, and humility, all increased by people who meditate. As our self-conscious is decreased, our awareness and concern for others increases. Sounds so much like Christ's likeness and the mind of Christ and the attitude of Christ that we should all desire. Remember my opening question? Here in conclusion, I'll remind you of it. Where are you searching for happiness? Where are you trying to get that esteem from? Where are you trying to get that affection or love or power? Where are you trying to seek control? Where are you going after uh, the respect that you want? Because we're all doing it. We're all searching for happiness. We're looking for happiness outside in all the wrong places. I want to remind you, true happiness can only be found inside in God's indwelling presence. I think so many of us, and I just want to remind you of this briefly because I can't remember if I even said it, but we, we're looking for God out here. We're trying to get our prayers through the roof. Understand God is in here. He's indwelling in you. So you're going to have to get quiet, focus inward where the presence of the Lord actually is. Repentance then is to change your program for happiness, whatever your formula is, to change it. Repentance is that, is to change your direction for emotional happiness. Turn to God who is the source and ask for forgiveness and begin a journey to freedom into true happiness through the intimate relationship with God and his indwelling presence in you. So I want to say a closing prayer this morning over you. If you'll bow your heads for a moment. Holy Spirit, we welcome you into our lives. We realized this morning that only God is our true source of happiness. Please help us to disband all of our other programs for happiness to realize we have been given the key already in you to turn back to the garden, put a longing in our hearts, God, to be with you, stir up within your people, a desire to know you. God, that we might find the happiness that we all long for. Bring peace to our hearts and our minds. Make us whole, well. Give us the freedom that we long for in all things in Christ. And God, more than anything, help us all to become who you created us to be, functioning fully in all of our giftings and callings that you have placed upon our lives. Oh, that your will would be done, that your kingdom would come, and that we would give up our will and our ways. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you this morning. 
I pray that you would pursue God and find what is hidden for you. Amen.